Hello and welcome to our podcast pager. I'm George Milner and I'm Stan Dale. Tune in to hear us talk with some amazing people about the subjects changing medicine today. From 2017 to 2018, 29% of UK adults and 20% of year six children were obese. At the same time, around two thirds of adults could be classed as overweight. What is behind the upward trend in obesity observed around the world? What are the risks of being overweight? And are all people affected in the same way? From our genes to our food environment, what drives body weight and how should this impact on how we can manage it? My guest today is the University of Cambridge geneticist, Dr. Giles Yeo. Dr. Yeo's research is focused around the genetic factors which influence food intake and body weight. From BBC Horizon episodes to public talks and lectures, Dr. Yeo is passionate about the spreading understanding of obesity and dispelling myths that can surround it. Welcome, Dr. Yeo. It's a pleasure to have you with me today. No, thank you for having me. Rates of adult and child obesity mm. are at record levels in the UK. Mm. Why should we be concerned about this? Well, let's start with the childhood obesity. A, a major problem with, ch- uh, with childhood obesity is the moment you become obese as a child, it's very difficult to become unobese as a child. Okay? So, so, so that's a, a huge problem. And so as a result, if you see these rates of childhood obesity uh, go- going up, this is, puts us in a dire position for adult obesity. Okay, well then let's deal with that adult adult obesity. Why should we be worried about that? You know, it is seldom the obesity that actually kills people. Yes, there is the problems of gravity. <laughs> so, so, so in other words, you get problems, things like osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, where where you get the problem of not being able to breathe hypoxia at night. Um, um you know, when you're sleeping. So, and those are, if severe, can cause you problems. Actually, what ends up killing you what ends up causing all the problems all the comorbidities so all of the associated nasty diseases such as type 2 diabetes um, cardiovascular disease hypertension certain types of cancers and actually if you actually take that list i just gave you and throw in obesity as well those are pretty much all of the non-communicable diseases out there and that is what is really killing us and putting a stress on the nhs so it is a big problem because not only because of obesity, but it's actually probably the driver of most of the diseases that are non-infectious that are killing us today. Hmm. And if you take a person or, or two people, sorry, with the, the same percentage body fat, are they going to be affected equally by that in terms of this risk of comorbidities? No. That, and, and that's actually a very, very good question. I mean, this all comes down to why is carrying too much fat bad for you, which is, which is what the question is. And people often get mistaken, you know, when they're thinking about fat, people think that when you gain weight, you gain fat cells. And when you lose weight, you lose fat cells, therefore putting the blame on the fat cell. The fat cell is an evil thing. We need to we need to destroy it. We need to get rid of it. Actually, that's not true. So what happens are fat cells are like balloons. So that when you gain weight, they get bigger like a balloon. And when you lose weight, they get smaller. And the safest place to store fat is within the fat cell. Okay, And it's when the fat is not within the fat cell, when it goes somewhere else, into your Mm. muscle, into your liver, other places, ectopically, that's when the problems begin. So carrying too much fat is a situation where the fat cells uh, get beyond the ability to store fat safely. Well, not only the fat cells, but where you you store it as well. When you lose the ability to store fat safely, that is when you get ill. The interesting thing is that people have different safe levels of fat that they can store. So, okay, for example, I'm myself, I'm ethnically Chinese. South, uh, East Asians and South Asians, so Asian Indians as well, have a problem of carrying, you know, not as much fat as someone who's white, as a Polynesian, for example, before they actually become ill. And that's because they have a lower safe fat carrying capacity. People th- th- thinking, for, for example, about the body positive uh, uh, movement, right? About body size. Mm-hmm. And... I think within a city, within a large population, there there are going to be health at many sizes, which means that you can be larger and be healthier than someone that's skinnier than you. But for for an individual, for you, for me, if I surpass my safe fat carrying capacity, I will become ill. So there we go. So I think the new ones we need to consider is our safe fat carrying capacity rather than necessarily our weight or BMI in absolute. And is there a danger that perhaps by sending out this message that there is a safe carry, fat carrying capacity, that people can assume that they are maybe in that 1% or in that 2% or 5% that actually have a higher capacity. In the same way that we see maybe with people thinking that, oh, I can get away with having six hours worth of sleep or five hours worth of sleep. I don't know if it is a dangerous message because I think you, when, if you become ill, you'll know about it pretty quickly. 
Uh, you you know, if suddenly you go to the doctor and someone tells you, oh, you know, you got you got type two diabetes, you got insulin resistance, so you're not even type two diabetic yet, but you're not that large, you'll soon you'll soon know about it. I think we need to get the message out that there is a nuance in terms of what we look like per se does not actually tell us how healthy we are. I think that's that is the going to be the point, and that there is a nuance behind being overweight. Okay, and what being overweight actually means. So I think as long as we tell people, educate people, I don't think I think that's going to be a minor problem. And almost on the other side of it, mm. we see perhaps more in maybe professional athletes, people carrying a large amount of muscle mass. Mm. Does this lead to any metabolic health concerns as well? Ah, oh, that's a very interesting question. As far as I understand, within the normal range of athleticism, I think, you know, carrying more muscle mass is going to be better for you. Particularly when you get older, the clear link in terms of morbidity, in terms of actually just just illness, the more muscle and mortality for that matter, the more muscle mass you have, the better it is for you. That being said, there are going to be situations where people take it over the top. You know, there are diseases in which you end up carrying too much muscle because of because of just, just you, you know, various diseases that are actually out there. Or you don't carry enough fat. That's another. That's another issue. Issue, issue entirely. That's a s- separate issue, I guess. But I think, by and large, very, very, very few of us are going to get in the position where we're carrying too much, too much muscle mass. So I, I, I think more muscle is a bit better. So moving on from nuances, mm. what do you think are perhaps some of the largest misconceptions surrounding obesity and diet that are bouncing around in the public sphere? Oh, that's a multi-part question. That's actually very many, very many things. Obesity, I guess we have uh, already touched on this. I mean, obesity is just a complex term of what is actually obesity. So my definition of obesity, the the definition of obesity, I'd like to think, is when you carry too much fat so that you actually tilt into disease or are at risk of disease. Okay, And so I think the misconceptions around there are a couple. A, that, that BMI per se is good enough, equates to fat mass. By and large, it probably does on a population level, but for the individual, that's very, that's actually very, very different. Okay, so I think that's probably one of the things we actually dealt with. And the second thing probably is the fact that obesity is a choice. And you know, and, and I don't think it is, which seems, which might seem an odd thing to say because people say, well, yeah, but you, you're choosing to put the cookie in your mouth. And that's true. But I guess your body weight, you know, you don't gain weight, you don't lose weight over, o- overnight. And your body weight tends up turns out to be a function of thousands of different food decisions you actually make every single day for like many years before. So if your biology, if your genetics influences your ability to say no, if you're slightly more driven towards food, well, then you're going to be in a situation where say two, three, four percent over a few thousand decisions, less likely to say no. Well, then you're going to be a different size as someone over, over time. So I think those are probably the two. So body weight and obesity being one end of the spectrum, I don't think is a choice because of one's biology. Diets. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'll say something and you can ask me more, more questions about it. I think the biggest, there are a few myths about diets that are, which, which, which are very, very famous. The first of all is that 95% of diets don't work. And this is actually not true. And let me tell you why it's not true. Because any diet which gets you to eat less and gets you to lose weight is a diet that works. Okay. The problem is people don't stick to the diets and so the weight comes back on. So I want to say that 95% of diets you can't stick to. Okay. And then I think that's probably the better explanation of, of that. And the second myth, the second myth is that there is some magical diet that actually suits everybody. Meaning that if you do it my way or the, it's, it's either my way or the highway. And that's, once again, is also not true. I think because of our personal biology, all of us will probably have some kind of diet that we are more likely to be able to, to stick to if you, if you need to lose weight. And that is likely to be personal to you, personal to not only your biology, which I think is going to be clear, okay, but also your lifestyle, your socioeconomic class. Do, do you cycle to work? Do you have kids? You know, and, 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 and what do you do for work? And all of those are going to influence the kind of diet that actually suits you. So there we go. Those are my two diet myths to to break. So at a simplistic level, Mm. weight gain and weight loss is a product of the difference between energy expenditure and energy intake. Mm. What factors do we know regulate energy intake, starting with that? 
on a daily basis. Okay, so you're you're absolutely right. Your weight is a function of physics. It has to be a function of physics because there's no way of getting around it. Um, where the biological variation uh, um, comes comes in is leading in and out of the out out of the physics. So why people behave differently uh, differently around food. Okay, well, I think they're going to be a, a multitude of different things that influence it. Okay, it could actually purely be down to a hunger or a fullness issue. So as we and I would would imagine, a grumbly tummy or not being able to feel full. So your brain needs, broadly speaking, two pieces of information in order to influence your food intake. It needs to know how much fat you have, um, and that's important because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. If, if your food stopped today, how long would you last? For an average human being like myself, like maybe you, you have slightly less fat than me, about three months okay, before we go, before we die. Right. So that's the first piece of information, long-term energy stores. The second piece of information your brain needs is what you have just eaten and what you are currently eating. And those signals are going to come from your, your gut and your stomach, your gastrointestinal tra tract. And um, because as you eat, you, your, the gastrointestinal tract releases signals, releases hormones, which indicate not only the caloric content, but also the macronutrient content of your meal. So how many calories and what, and what you've just eaten. Your brain senses and translates, integrates these signals, how much fat, what you've just eaten, and then influences your next interaction with a menu or, or, or food, okay? Now, some of these, so we now know of over 300 genes that influence feeding behavior. And um, some of these genes influence the sensitivity uh, of your brain to these signals. So for example, you could be carrying 20 kilos of fat, for example, but if your brain was slightly less sensitive to these signals so that it's sensing instead 18 kilos of fat, well, it's going to think, well, hang on a second, I thought I had 20 kilos of fat. And so your brain then begins to drive you to eat more to get you to 20 kilos of fat. But if you already are at 20 kilos of fat, suddenly you're going to become heavier. Equally, your brain, say you had 1,000 calories for lunch or for dinner, but your brain was slightly less sensitive to these gut signals and sense only 800 calories. You see where I'm going here. Well, then it drives you to eat more. And so therefore, we could be in the same situation where we are sat there in the same restaurant, in the same kitchen, eating exactly the same meal. But yet I, because of my biology, end up eating more than you because I feel hungrier than, 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 than you. And so that is, yeah. Now, I mean, I think that illustrates the, some of the biological variation that could occur between, between two different people. And interestingly, um, linking back to your point that childhood obesity often translates into adult obesity, mm -hmm. these differences that we see between individuals, are they gained on a genetic level or perhaps on an epigenetic or an acquired level? Why do we see these differences between between individuals in perhaps how they respond to signals from the rest of their, um, their body? Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Um, okay, I think they're going to be a mixture of both, but it's overwhelmingly going to be a... Hmm. No, 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 no. Let, let, let's take this back. I think that that's, that's, there are going to be multiple components to, to why somebody becomes obese. And I think a large part of it is going to be down to genetic variation, actual genetic variation in and of itself. So the heritability of body weight, because that's what we're talking about here, is between 50 and 70%. Okay, so, so that is the kind of the amount that our genes will actually play. And you can then read, therefore, between 30 and 50% is going to be down to the environment, which is everything else. Okay, now the environment can include what you eat, what you do, um, as well as, interestingly, your socioeconomic class. So I think, that beginning with that, 50 to 70% heritability. Epigenetics, which you, which you actually talked, uh, just briefly talked about, and that is obviously DNA modifications that influence how genes turn on and turn off. All right, I consider those to be the to be the interface between the environment and the genes because your environment can influence the epigenetic mm -hmm. marks, therefore influencing how your genes turn on and turn off. But they are a response to the environment rather than to your genes um, per se. And so I think epigenetics will play a role, but that is a interface between the environment um, and, and, and your genes. So over the last few decades, mm -hmm. we've seen quite a dramatic rise in obesity around, around the world, certainly around the Western world. Mm -hmm. All over the world yeah. now. And what perhaps on an environmental level could explain some of these, uh, some of these quite dramatic changes that obviously aren't driven by majorly by changes in genetics. Mm. So I think the the, the I'll, I'll deal with the second part of the question first because I think um, a lot of people do ask this, 
and say that, well, hang on a second, you're talking about genetics, 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 but yet everyone was skinny in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And this, and this is true. So your genes haven't changed. How come we've become more obese? It must be the environment. And so the environment has driven these changes, okay? But our genes influence how we respond to it. So, let, so the analogy which I, which I like to use is, imagine I have a twin, and my twin is stood next to me. In one environment, say 1955, okay, we, we both look exactly the same. Okay, because we're twins. The environment changes. Now it's 2014, 2019, pardon me. And the environment changes and you come along and you push me and you push my twin. Okay, if you push me, I tense up my leg muscles and I stand still and I don't fall over. Unbeknownst to anybody, my twin has sprained his leg. Okay, and when you push him, he falls over. So in one environment where you're not pushing us, say this is the 1950s, okay, where the food environment is different, we look exactly the same. Suddenly you add a stressor to the situation, the environment changes, or you shove me or you shove my twin, and a susceptibility is suddenly uncovered. So the environment has actually uncovered, exposed genetic susceptibilities, or allowed that to actually come, come, come to the fore. Now, what might some of these be? I think these are well rehearsed. I mean, for, for one thing, we now do completely different things in terms of work-wise. We don't do physical or manual labor by and large anymore. We have dishwashers, we uh, drive a lot, and we have more office-based work, okay? So, so I think these are well rehearsed, A. Mm. B, I think the food environment has changed. So never has food been more readily available, okay? Been cheaper, so, mm. so, so pennies per a calorie per penny or per pennies per calorie, um, has it been actually been, been, been cheaper? Now, this has been a, a wonderful thing in terms of keeping 7 billion people alive in the world. OK, so I'm not actually, you know, we have to accept this. It has kept us as a human species alive and thriving. I think the problem, however, in a push to get more for less in the pr uh, for to look for greater and greater efficiencies, I do think we have somehow broken our food environment in terms of the type of food we have available. The UNICEF report, the 2019 UNICEF report to childhood malnutrition, malnutrition came out probably just a couple of months ago. And in it, they ask. I think a very, very good and very, very poignant question. And it's that, why are so many kids not getting enough of what they need? So that is your typical uh, idea of poverty and starvation. Mm. And so many others, in fact, more now than the, than, than the former, getting too much of what they don't need. We have now reached the first point in our society, the first point in our history, where there are more people suffering from overnutrition of the wrong things than actual malnutrition in, in, in of itself. And so there is that issue as well. So I think it's the different types of foods that we're eating, ultra-processed foods, which per se are not bad for you, but because of the availability of the calories within those ultra-processed foods, A, meaning that you can absorb more calories, and B, because they're so processed, you require to add more fat, sugar, and salt, the stuff which makes food taste good, in, in order to make the food tastier, because all the taste has been removed through the ultra processing. And so that's the second thing. And third thing is that the proliferation of these foods, that we can actually get them as easily. We can now sit on a couch, okay, and order. You don't have to move from your house. And you can order Uber Eats and, and you know, and Deliveroo, and the food gets delivered directly to your house. And so I think it's that mix of everything that you actually have there together introduce genetic susceptibility and you have the obesity problem we have now. So finally, to finish things off, mm. if you were to communicate one message about this entire field in a few sentences, what would it be then? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, am I, how many sentences am I allowed? Let's go with three sentences. I think the first thing, first thing is first, that obesity and body weight is not a choice. We've talked about this before. Um, it simply is not a choice. There's some people who, because of their biology, find it more difficult to say no. Okay? And we have to accept this because if we don't accept this, then we're not going to be able to fix the problem. It doesn't change the physics. We still need to eat less, but it, doesn't cha but it won't change the problem. And if you do need to lose weight, you've got to find a way. I don't want to sound like a fortune cookie, but I am. You've got to find a way that suits you because there's no one size that fits all. And hopefully going into the future, we'll be able to grapple with these issues a bit more. Dr. Yeo, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It's been a brilliant conversation. You're very welcome. If you enjoyed this conversation, then do have a listen to the second part of our discussion around how it could be possible to reduce rates of obesity and the challenges faced all the way from public health to individual treatment. Goodbye from us for now.